So uh, thank you, uh, everybody, and thanks for coming out. Um, a quick note on terminology before I jump in. In the uh, session abstract, I use the term predatory publisher in square quotes. Uh, there is no set definition of what is a predatory publisher. And also, the term is very problematic. So I used it just to really kind of be clear about what I was talking about, because it's the most common term. But for the rest of the presentation, I will not be using that term. And I will be using terms like uh, deceptive publisher, or deceptive outlet, or sketchy, or you know any number of, uh, uh, of uh, things that you could find in a thesaurus, for example. Um, so my name is Jeanette, and I am a scholarly communication librarian. And as such, I get quite a few questions on uh, the topic of deceptive publishers. So a few years ago, uh, I had a professor get in touch with me, um, and she was working with a PhD student, uh, like her, you know, she was supervising at our institution, and they were working with a researcher at another institution, uh, kind of early career researcher, different country, doesn't really matter the context, um, but, Anyways, <laughs> um, the other researcher, sort of unbeknownst to them, uh, had actually submitted an article that they were all working on together to a journal. Uh, and so kind of the publication ethics thing of submitting without consent is, is one thing. Um, but sort of unbeknownst to them, it was in not the best journal maybe. The prof uh, had sort of heard of this issue before and so she called me up and we looked at the website kind of together and like all of the red flags. It was pretty clear that this was a scam publisher. So um, the inevitable kind of question came up then at that point, which is what now? You know, what do I do with this article? There's the immediate what now, this one particular article, but what I'd like to talk about today is the what now with all of the articles already in these, uh, in these outlets. Uh, and um, it seems to me that this is actually a problem that no one's really talking about. Um, there is a, a sort of a research out there uh, that, in my opinion, is sort of at risk of being lost, right? Think about these publishers. Uh, if they go out of business or they just close up shop, um, this research is at risk of being lost. Moreover, it's not kind of indexed, it's not discoverable, and it's not preserved, right? So this is a problem, and uh, it's also a problem because it's potentially valuable research. So my contention is here that it's potentially valuable because if you think about it, that prof and that researcher and that grad student had good research that they did and they thought was worth communicating, but by virtue of just where it appeared, sort of for all intents and purposes, it's kind of now lost. Um, and so how big is this sort of problem that we're talking about? So the scope of it, uh, back in uh, 2015, uh, Shannon Bjork published sort of the first large-scale analysis of the market characteristics and volume of the sort of predatory publishing market. So, uh, and they found about 8,000 publications um, uh, produced over 420,000 articles. Now, since then, there hasn't been a replication of this study or kind of an update to it, so it is hard to say how that market has or has not grown, but it's a rough proxy. Uh, Cabell's in, tw in uh, 2019, just this year, uh, says that they list 1,200, uh, sorry, 12,000 questionable publications. And I don't intend here to kind of go into the issues of blacklisting and whitelisting and sort of even the question of the different methodologies of how they come up to that. That's kind of beside the point. What I'm trying to say is that for a reasonable proxy, we can assume that there are well over half a million articles out there at this point, right? It's been five years since the original study was published. Um, so what about these uh, articles? Uh, as I said, there is no currently agreed upon standard definition of what constitutes a quote unquote predatory publisher. But in the literature, in the research, and in all those lists and guides and discussions, there are a few kind of themes that come out. And one of them is that the peer review is questionable. Right? So the World Association of Medical Editors says that such journals do not provide the peer review that is the hallmark of scholarly publishing. Now interestingly, 
that may not be true. So there are a small, small, small number of studies that have looked at authors' perceptions of peer review in these outlets, and a majority of them believe that it had undergone peer review that was substantial, helpful, or of similar quality to other outlets. Now, there are very few studies, the sample sizes and the response rates are incredibly low. So this is not something that I can generalize, um, and I wouldn't, but um, uh, it's just sort of like an interesting thing to sort of note that these sort of uh, low sample sizes to me suggest that there's a bit of a stigma, right? There isn't a lot of research out there, people don't want to talk about this. And also, to kind of depending on how the question and these uh, things were phrased, there's a potential for a lot of bias. You know, did they approach the author? Hey, you published in a predatory outlet, want to talk about it? Versus, how did you feel about publishing in this venue? But I digress. What I wanted to sort of talk about was like this stigma that is potentially associated with this sort of you know predatory outlets. So, despite author perception and the limited uh, research done on it, uh, a large percentage uh, of of the research that has uh, appeared in these has not been adequately peer reviewed. Uh, also, authors see their work sort of published in these venues often without uh, their consent, you know, or they don't know that it's been published. Uh, maybe they don't pay the fee or there's no uh, copyright uh, agreement signed. So, without all the harl marks of legitimate scholarly publishing, do we actually need to consider these articles published? Or, can we consider it as research that has not yet been validated? So, I'll just, uh, da -da. with that part in mind, I'm going to take a little sip of water because it's very hot here. So, I'm letting you sit with that thought for a second. As I mentioned before, there isn't a lot of discussion about this, and the literature bears it out. So uh, a recent review that I did, I found 514 articles that talk about predatory publishing. Uh, they were published between 2010 and 2019. And 92% of them kind of talk about the article in a way that I would sort of say pre-publication. Uh, uh, and so these are ones that kind of talk about the issue, um, kind of informing researchers, alerting them, letting them know that it's a problem. Uh, maybe they talk about sort of the blacklist, the whitelist, the limitations of these, the racial dimensions of these, the controversies. Uh, they talk maybe about the, um, the size and characteristics, the, the kind of quantity, the scope of the, uh, of the issue. Uh, or maybe they talk about um, sort of contextualizing it in the broader kind of broken scholarly ecosystem that, that we were just so uh, presented with. Uh, or they kind of talk about it in a kind of global north, global south perspective. But 92% of them really kind of talk about like the article before it gets published. And only 8% talk about, you know, the, the what now, right? Like what I'm talking about. And so there's about uh, 40 articles that like look at the what now. And of those, 16 of them actually answer my question. Like what now with the article? The rest of them kind of talk about like impact on career uh, progression or um, uh, looking at it from like an ethical or a legal perspective. So, so in the thing, but they don't answer my question. So what do those 16 articles say? Those, the ones that I'm interested in. So most of them say that you, can, you should be able to retract it. The consensus view is that authors could or should retract articles that appear in these outlets. Um, and this is despite kind of a noted difficulty with this course of action, right? Like sometimes the questionable venue will demand payment or something. So it is difficult to do, but they do suggest that it be done. Some suggest that you could submit it to a new journal, uh, including the World Association of Medical Editors, uh, that it could be submitted to a new journal, but it's not universally accepted. Some people say, no, like that's it. You can't submit it to my journal. It's too good, and yours is not good enough. Um, there isn't even a consensus on whether you should acknowledge this article, uh, which is a problem, right? How, whether, where on the CV do you put uh, this, this article. So there's no kind of consensus, there's no guidelines, it's pretty murky out there. You can't really answer the question. So that's where my proposal comes in. Can we harness 
preprint servers and open peer review to tackle this problem? Could an author retract the article, as consensus says that they should be able to, submit it to a preprint server for open peer review and essentially have the community validate this not yet validated research. So um, a few considerations for this approach. First one being copyright. So, so far discussions surrounding this kind of retraction and resubmission uh, only focus on, yes, you can do it because you never signed a copyright transfer agreement. Like that's the only consideration so far that I can find about this sort of republication that I can find there. If you know of any, please let me know. But this misses a key feature of open access, which is the copyright remains with the author. So as long as it's under a CC BY license, there's nothing under a copyright framework that would prevent this. What about publication ethics? So uh, the World Association of Medical Editors, COPE, uh, ICJ, um, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, uh, all address the idea of duplicate publication under an ethical framework of deception on the part of the author, right? So they're trying to deceive and submit to multiple places at once. But the transparency about the, like, the initial place of publication kind of solves this, right? Um, and Wayne even suggests that authors whose legitimate research was published should have a mechanism, right? So, so everybody agrees that this kind of like ought to happen, but nobody talks about it in the open peer review and preprint way, right? So theoretically, it seems sound. Where theory meets practice is where things get a little bit murkier. So just briefly, what am I talking about when I talk about open peer review? Now, despite being sort of like a pillar of open science, um, there isn't really, kind of like predatory publishing, uh, there is an agreed upon definition of what, what is open peer review, so I'm just gonna be a little bit more clear. Uh, so it's an umbrella term for a number of kind of overlapping ways that peer review can be kind of adapted in line with the aims of open science. Now this is proposed by Open Air and uh, Ross Talauer, um, I forget his first name, uh, but they propose sort of seven traits that can be kind of used in any sort of combination. So uh, the idea of sort of open identities being that like sort of the authors uh, and, uh, and reviewers are aware of each other identities, the reports could be openly published, the peer review could be openly uh, published, there could be community participation in open peer review. Uh, interaction between reviewers and authors and amongst reviewers could be sort of uh, opened up. Uh, we could look at sort of pre-review manuscripts, so the kind of preprint idea. The idea of final version commenting is how they term it. You may, I, I understand it as post-publication peer review. I think they just wanted like open at the beginning of all of their seven traits. So they used open pre-review manuscripts and open final version commenting, which I'm gonna trip over in the next few slides. Um, so, uh, and then sort of open platforms, which is where the review is decoupled from the place of publication. So those could kind of exist in any and all um, um, combinations. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about open peer review? Uh, when I was originally kind of thinking of this idea, I had preprints in mind, preprint servers and sort of pre-review because research that is not yet validated is analogous to a preprint, right? If there's been no peer review, if there's been no sort of quality like hallmark of publishing, isn't it just the same as a preprint? Like if, if you haven't done anything to the article, it's the same article as, as, as before you submitted it. So, um, uh, um, mm -hmm. However, most preprint servers do specify that research must not already be published. So I hit a bit of a wall here, um, right off the bat. But this is a policy, not a technical or theoretical problem. And policies are made by people, and people can change their minds. So that's how I'm working around this. So I would sort of urge uh, uh, that anybody who's sort of uh, working in this space 
to kind of reframe their thinking around what is sort of previously published. And those who sort of manage and set policies for these could kind of establish a guideline or some sort of mechanism to allow for what I'm suggesting today. And most of these do include actually a kind of a submission review component to the preprint server. So there is an intervention already. So within that intervention, the author could sort of, I imagine, uh, provide some, some documentation or some evidence supporting their contention that their submission has not been peer reviewed, right? So if their contention that it underwent no peer review, the simple act of submitting the preprint and the final published version is sufficient proof of that. If their contention is that the, superior, the peer review is insufficient, um, you could just submit that kind of peer review report, you know, that says, article well written that's not substantial peer review, you could provide that sort of as evidence. So you could theoretically, and I urge people who are uh, working in the preprint space or maybe building them right now, um, <laughs> could perhaps kind of consider this as part of the workflow. Uh, the other sort of uh, element that I kind of had sort of in mind was that sort of open final version commenting is what they call it, call it post-publication peer review, and that sort of decoupled review. And there are two platforms out there, both PubPeer and Science Open, that work on an essentially a DOI lookup mechanism. So you enter your DOI of the article that's been quote unquote published, uh, and then you could then actively solicit reviews from people in your field, right? So the author could sort of say, you know, please, person in my field who I respect the opinion of, could you please review my manuscript and do that validation? So this solves the validation problem, but it doesn't actually solve the preservation problem and that, that sort of losing, lost science uh, problem. So this is sort of a, a question of, like, it could work, but it's, it solves only part of, of the problem. So, are preprint servers and open peer review a solution? No. But, <laughs> like I said, policies and guidelines are set by people. And I would urge everybody to start rethinking how we think about the, art, about the research, about the articles that appear in these questionable venues. And to no longer consider it bad research that's in bad journals, but as research that has not yet been validated and is at risk of being lost. And disciplinary communities need to start thinking about this because it is their responsibility to ensure that the work of their, of their, uh, their, their researchers is, uh, is, is incorporated into the scholarly record. So I would urge anybody with any sort of um, uh, input or guidance or power into these things to sort of help me answer the question, what now?